Um, and we've got a couple other people here today. Were you at one of the talks yesterday too? Yeah. 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 Okay. When well, you came to the science fiction one? The article picking? Yeah. No, maybe the Batman one then. Okay. Anyhow, you look familiar. Um, I'm Daryl Frazetti. I teach up at Western Nevada College. I told you guys some of that last night at the two panels I had yesterday. And a lot of my work focuses on pop culture research, particularly fandom cultures. And I've got some published work out there on Star Trek fandom culture. And my book, Anthropology of Star Trek, is a cultural anthropology course textbook using Star Trek. Um, yeah, and I've got those down at my table. Those came out last summer, and um, I've had enough of a breather where I'm now ready to start my Batman work. And the Batman survey is up online, and I can give you all of that information. This flyer is on my table. I'm going back to back in my talks right through to 5 o'clock, but please feel free to go down past my table. I've left all the information out there, and I also have on my cards which will give you the website, and if you want any of the PowerPoints or any articles or to contact me in general, you know, that the information's on these cards too, okay? I feel bad that I won't be back at the table before the convention closes down. But uh, after this talk, I go downstairs for um, the Hulk, and then I come back upstairs again for Wonder Woman. So hopefully I'll see more of you at those as well. Anyhow, the topic of the day here is X-Men as a cultural cultural mirror, um, and I liked some of these quotes, which were just amazing quotes. One from Magneto on the bottom, mankind has always feared what it does not understand, or what it doesn't understand, and we know that. People in power find ways to demonize different groups of individuals and make blanket statements about individuals to keep people in fear of them. How many ethnic groups can we think of offhand that this has happened to throughout history? Right? Indigenous populations, the whole nine yards. So in a lot of ways, to me, you know, one of the, one of the aspects of X-Men represents this ongoing issue of humans fearing something it doesn't understand and the politics of trying to continue to marginalize the group it doesn't want entering mainstream society in any way and gaining any kind of power on its own. So you, you see this struggle between how Charles approaches trying to make the X-Men mainstream and have society accept them as just regular members of society as opposed to how Eric or Magneto goes about, you know, this militant way of, you know, basically an extremist type militant manner and he hates the humans. And he thinks that they're superior to these normal humans. And, you know, we're the wave of the future. We're taking over. And they are going to listen to us. And, um, you know, militancy, extremism gives the X-Men a bad name, just like it, it does with any other group that may go to those lengths. Okay. And, um, you know, really it's about looking at racism, bigotry, and prejudice when you're looking at X-Men. I have some other questions I raise. Um, within the context of the X-Men as well. But for the most part, what we're looking at is really what it means to be human. And we can certainly cover that in depth looking at the X-Men, looking at our contemporary social issues, some of them I just mentioned briefly, creating the X-Men, looking at the biology of the genetics, the genetic manipulation, the genetic technologies we have at our disposal today a lot of ethical dilemmas that we deal with on a regular basis that pertain to gene manipulation. We have a lot of ways to cure diseases and conditions genetically, but that genetic ability also allows us to do other things that we are currently doing, um, including changes, changing the sex of a baby before it's even born. Right down to that. Um, you know, this, and the, obviously the need for uh, diversity and the role of the individual in society. And the X-Men as mythos, looking at the, the franchise itself and its overall influence in a cultural sense. So looking at this, you know, what does it mean to be human? Well, we've been talking about this since the beginning of time. Do you know in anthropology, in biological anthropology, they still can't figure out how to classify Neanderthals. People are still arguing about this. 
Are they human? Are they not? Over time, if you ever really look at the literature, or even just go online and poke around, you'll find that this is a huge controversy. We, we still haven't decided if they belong in the human lineage or not. Are they Homo neanderthalensis, which is their own subspecies? Or are they Homo sapien neanderthalensis? Or are they just Homo sapiens? So if you really ever get into the ins and outs of biological anthropology, I can tell you you will never be bored. But we, we still work on classifying groups like this, prehistoric groups, and trying to figure out, well, what makes us human? What makes us different than other human forms that have existed on this planet? A lot of people say it's our linguistic ability or our cultural development. Well, yeah, but they had a valid culture. They had a linguistic system. So what, doesn't, what is not making them as human as you would you would think. What differentiates them? Their DNA overlaps with Homo sapien DNA. There's mixed genetic material in a lot of the fossils. So were they human or were they not human? So that, you know, where do we classify them? So we've really been wrestling with this for decades outside of X-Men. X-Men does a great job of looking at what does it mean to be human because you've got the humans that don't have the X gene. Well, does that mean they're now inferior and we do have a superior Homo sapien that's emerged and they should take over and swamp out the humans that don't have the X mutation? That's what Eric would like to do. It's not what Charles would like to do. So two different approaches, two different ways of classifying humans. We're all human. No, we're not. We're better than those humans. So again, looking at wrestling with classifying things and defining humanity and what it means to be human. You know, and again, we could ask, are there subspecific groups of humans today? Politically, sure. We could, we could say that subgroups of humans have certainly existed, and people politically, from a political standpoint, want you to believe that there still are subgroups of humans. White European males have really been the dominant political force since the beginning of, of at least the United States, and on a global level for the most part. Um, but if we look right here in the United States, well, how many groups have we classified as inferior? Hitler did it to the Jews. Well, and, and, and this also has a very long history. If you look at racial classification of humans, which is also something that biological anthropology deals with, you know, we were doing something called craniometrics back in, you know, back in the day, in the 40s, 50s, right? Um, even in the, into the 1960s, people were still practicing this, measuring people's cranial features and determining intelligence based on those features compared to white European Caucasian cranium. So we would take Asian cranium and measure different features of the eyes, the forehead, the cranial capacity, you know, the shape of the skull and everything, and determining someone's IQ ability, and not just one person's, for the entire ethnic group that they came from. We did the same thing with African Americans, all based on measurements and comparing those measurements to the white European skulls of the time, and saying, well, you know, these, and Hitler, Hitler took this to extremes, obviously, with what he was doing in determining that Jews were an inferior race and the whole, we need to have purebred, you know, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, superior human kind of thing. And we all know, you know, about his experimentations and what happened in, in Nazi Germany. Uh, but people have tried to classify ethnic groups as subspecific groups of the main human species. And so, well, who's the main human species? The white Europeans? And then how do you fit in the Asians, the Africans, and all these other ethnic groups around that? Back in 1998, American Anthropological Association took a stand and said there is no viable biological classification of humans. It's all one species. We can go anywhere on the planet and interbreed very successfully with any other human and produce fertile offspring. There's your definition of a species. There is no subspecific way to classify humans based on physical features or colors of skin. 
And so American Anthropological Association took that stand and put out an entire newsletter in 1998 on that and put out a formal statement. People still try to do it? Sure, mainly for political reasons, really. Uh, so we've looked at African Americans, we've looked at the Jews, um, LGBT individuals. They're on the block too. Are they, are they lesser humans? But there are groups that politically would like you to think this. And there are religious groups that would like you to think this. And sometimes one and the same, the religious and political groups share a common ideology and a common goal of eradicating this from our population. Uh, now the Pope, interestingly enough, in 2012, very progressive statement, stated that they were not fully developed humans in 2012 and stated that they were injurious to marriage and family and therefore to society itself. And there you have the leading authority on every subject pertaining to what, what proper humans should be and what they are not. Know what I said earlier, this is a very progressive statement. Obviously, I was being, you know, a little bit of sarcasm thrown in there. Um, how do you say these people are not human? Well, the Pope said it, so it must be so. And the Pope is the, the, the spiritual leader of the free world, and then some. If it came from the Pope, it must, be the, it must be it. And how many people buy into this? Because that's their leader in some way. They look up to this individual for guidance and advice. And the, huh? No, go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, we, can, we have time. We, we can go take a field trip and get ourselves another new pope. You know, I mean, until we get one that, that you know, counteracts these statements. So we look at the X-Men, after all of this, we're looking at our Neanderthals, we're looking at what happened in Nazi Germany, to the African Americans, to the LGBT population, to the X-Men. The X-Men are representations of all these groups that have been marginalized politically. For what reason? So that people in power maintain their power, for the most part. They don't want to give it up. I mean, my goodness, Obama was still never fully accepted as a president. You know, there were people that still went after him to try to show that he was inferior because he was a black person. And people continued to attack him just for that alone. Um, it doesn't make anybody less of a human. I mean, last I checked, yeah, we can go anywhere on the planet and interbreed successfully with other humans of any variety and produce fertile offspring. So all one species, we all have common interests and share a common goal. And that's what I think is wonderful about the mutants and X-Men, is that it portrays this in an extreme way to get us to really think about the, the varieties of humans that we have here and, and what's happening to them, or what has happened to various groups over time. And we continue to repeat this. I mean, what the, Gosh, World War II, right after Pearl Harbor, we rounded up people who were U.S. citizens. They were U.S. citizens. Oh, you're of Japanese descent. We've got to round you up and put you in the concentration camp. Anybody's ever heard George Takei from Star Trek talk about his life? He was an American citizen, and they put him in a concentration camp with his family during all this because he was Japanese. So, so there are no rules to this. If you or even if you're one of our citizens, if you belong to the group of the day, have a nice day. So I think X-Men does a wonderful job with its portrayal of diversity and this struggle to just be considered just as human as everybody else. That's one of Charles's big goals. And we'll talk about the differences between Charles and, and uh, Eric in a bit. 1960s, the debut of X-Men comics focused on these issues of racism, prejudice, and this whole good versus evil theme, which makes sense for all the social uprisings that were taking place, the civil rights movement, and so on and so forth. X-Men was really born out of the civil rights movement during the 60s. It was very successful. Uh, there was a rebirth of X-Men comics um, because they took a dip for a while. Uh, they came back, they didn't, they, they didn't maintain that level of diversity in their comics. And it dipped off, you know, later on, 
where in the 60s, it was the early 70s when there was a rebirth of this comic, the minute they created a more ethnically diverse X-Men team. So they start, they have characters, Colossus from the Soviet Union, Wolverine came out of Canada, Storm is Kenyan, and Thunderbird was a Native American. Comic soared again. People wanted to read it. There was new, new interest in X-Men comics because people were drawn to that diversity. They saw themselves being represented through X-Men. And, and that gives people a lot of hope when they see that, and they see that struggle, and they can relate to that struggle. X-Men, again, 1982, the graphic novel, God Loves, Man Kills, inspired, um, inspired that X2 film that we saw. I don't know if you've all seen all the films. And I'd love to do a talk just on William Stryker someday. Oh, I just don't like him at all. In any of the films, in any of them, this, this is like the rebirth of Hitler in William Stryker here. And his problem really was his kid was a mutant. And he couldn't handle this. He never could come to terms with it. And he blamed Charles for what happened to his son, Jason. And that Charles could never help him. But he was out to get those mutants. And I think it was just him reacting from a personal level of rejecting his own son because I think he had, you know, maybe embarrassment. Maybe he felt somehow, you know, his gene pool was defective with what, what's happened to my kid, you know. And, you know, he can never tell anybody he has a son, really. So whatever caused him personally to act out, I mean, his big mission became, let's go get the mutants. You know, and we see that. He, he's, you know, William Stryker in the comics here in this particular graphic novel, he's a minister and he's throwing up anti-religious sentiments against the mutants. Well, 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 how many, how many ways can we apply that across our history? A lot. A lot. I mean, and that's, how, that's a scary thought. And we see the cyclic, who's the group of the day? You know, let's, what can we stir up against that particular group and get the public concerned about that particular group? So that, I mean, the big Muslim bands going out there fighting in court about this thing. You know, the traveling said, really, do you think all Muslims are terrorists? According to our political leaders, yes, of course they all are. Just like all mutants are, are terrorizing maniacs like Eric. You know, no, you have your extreme groups, or, you know, you have your extreme groups within these populations, and I can see, like, Eric, who always wrestles with the good and the evil, because he's friends with Charles, he's wrestling with his, his own anger towards the other humans, he's wrestling with his anger towards the Nazis and his upbringing, and all the things he's been through and all the things he's seen, and he knows that he needs to fight against it, but he doesn't see Charles's way as being very quick in bringing about change. So he takes on this more militant approach to it and reacts that way. But this is what goes on, yeah. We're stirring up anti-religious sentiments against the mutants and fighting for genocide based on religious morals. You know, the mutants are the devil's children. Oh my God, I mean, we could sit here all day and recite every group in history that this has been going on with, right? 1990s, we see another change in the X-Men comics. Um, we see, you know, a question that I put out there, why all, the, why all the more mainstream changes in alienation of fans by Marvel with the internal changes? Marvel started making some changes with the comics, pulling away from those big, bold social statements and taking on social causes and that diversity again to step back. I mean, it's gone, you know, you've had different writers come and go as well, and that's where all these changes start to come in. You don't want to remake X-Men. Well, in the 2000s, we see another resurgence of the comic. Um, some of the classic example comics, Messiah Complex, Myth for Extinction, Endangered Species, Manifest Destiny, you know, all these comics that came out that brought to light these big social issues and the fight for acceptance in society by all the marginalized groups. So X-Men, you know, has gone through these ups and downs where they're easy to identify with, easy to spot the issues in, bring people, you know, this idea of hope and that they too can fight for acceptance in their world. And then they kind of lag off for a while. If you haven't read any of the comics, um, you know, definitely take a look at some of them. But excellent. These PowerPoints with all my notes and all the references to the comic series and each specific title and what they deal with is all on my website. You can download the PowerPoints. 
you know, I don't want anyone to suffer and be saying, oh my gosh, what was that comic? No, I want you to have the notes, so the notes are up there. Then we also have a distinct subculture, the mutant society. Now, this is also only portrayed in the comics. It has not been done on film yet in any of the X-Men films. Well, you've got the Morlocks, and the Morlocks really come out in the films in terms of the brotherhood of mutants that Eric or, or Magneto develops. But we never really get to see the extent of the Morlock society. They're not referred to as Morlocks the way we see in, in the comics. So there is a difference there, but I think they did a good job of developing Eric's brotherhood, you know, and some of the places they choose to hide out as depicting this dark underground type of society. Um, we see it in Days of Future Past. Everybody's kind of hiding underground. The mutants have to hide themselves in some way to protect themselves from the Sentinels. And even in some instances, you know, when they do the flashbacks, you've got Charles's X-Men trying to protect themselves from Eric's, you know, brotherhood of mutants. Uh, so you've got the, you've got an internal type of civil war that's always going on as well between the good and the evil in the mutant population. But of course, again, this mirrors our ethnic, religious neighborhoods and our schools, you know, inner cities and the whole idea of marginalization and poverty-stricken people that are not empowered in any way, shape, or form in their own society. Uh, you know, pick a group, inner cities, disabled groups, LGBT, ethnicities. You know, you see all this. The Warsaw Ghetto in Poland during World War II. Um, you know, and I would say definitely each mutant society or each mutant group that's represented does have a distinct subculture that they relate to in our own world. So we're looking again through X-Men at distinct group identity, group worldview, group ideologies and beliefs, and individuality and diversity still within that group. Because again, we take the mutants, you've got Charles running his school and trying to find very positive ways to become mainstream. And then you've got Eric on the extreme end of the same group, the mutant group, they're all mutants. And you've got Charles, you know, trying to annihilate all the humans that don't have the X gene because of how they're treating the mutants. Same thing that we see in our own society, really, and you see that individual diversity within these groups, you know. And as we, we used the Muslim example a minute ago, not every Muslim's out to blow up the world, you know. We have what the uh, the Christian crusade, with every Christian trying to, you know gain power and take over things and gain wealth? No. no. I mean, there are people that give group, their groups a bad name. So we see this definitely, you know, in the mutant world and that continuing struggle on an ethnic and even an ideological level. You've got, you know, Xavier's students that uh, like to hide, remain, you know, kind of remain low key. And then you've got the Morlocks living underground and really becoming more and more isolated from society, but they're causing that themselves, the way that they're, they're behaving, the way they're reacting to society. And that happens to a lot of groups as well. If you're out there being militant against the system because you're fighting for change, you're going to marginalize yourself more than they've already marginalized you, and that's going to help perpetuate those stereotypes they're putting out there and the fears they're trying to create in the general population to further marginalize you. So we see the two different approaches here very glaringly, and the more successful approach being the work from within the system to fight with the system to bring that change about. I mean, gosh, Beast becomes a... He, he ends up holding some kind of political office in the later X-Men's. The one that, oh gosh, I forget the, which movie it was now. But, I mean, it's the one when Kelsey Grammer played Beast. You know, he was a political official at that point. Anyhow, we've got other issues that pop up here. You know, I love this. This was just a picture I had to include. No mutants in my America. Really? Now, now we could replace the image with several other images throughout time very easily. And that, you know, it, we laugh about it, but at the same time, this is terrifying. This is our world, and we keep repeating these cycles. So what are we not doing right? You know, how, how are we not breaking away 
and looking at this from, you know, we're all in this together, we're living on the same planet, we're all human, we all have the same basic needs, why can't we make that leap to a more humanistic ideology? Yeah, people get scared and, and political leaders can't make that break either. And we're not talking just the United States. Political leaders around the world do the same thing. Anybody that's holding those offices and maintaining their power structure is instilling fear about differences in other groups. I mean, there's plenty of people around the globe, you know, that, that don't like people in the United States. Oh, you're American. We don't like you. Oh, well, here's the list of things we've heard about you. <laughs> As you get off the plane, oh, you want to land in our country? No, so you get the list here that you're American. See this list? Don't come here. You know, I mean, there's people, plenty of people say that about us, too. So there's these blanket statements that governments are putting out, and they're maintaining their political power. And so nothing's ever really changing. You know, and it's always a new group of the day. Sometimes we visit the old group, too. Well, sometimes we've got several things going on simultaneously with you. Um, so, we're looking at that which is different. Physical limitations, people with disabilities. They've always had a fight for acceptance in the mainstream. And they've had a fight for rights as well. Gender identity, sexual orientation, your physical appearance. People, it, 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 I mean, right down to the basics. Weight, height, do you have any injuries, scars, your skin color. What's What's different about you that makes you look odd? And how dare you come to my place of employment and ask me for a job? We know that people are being discriminated against because of something even simple like their size, whether it's weight or height or something, it's happening. Or their age. Ageism, sexism, uh, you know, weight is a whatever we want to call it. I'm not sure if weightism is an actual term, but let's put it out there. I know, and I, yeah. Technically, size is just a thing. They make it weird to term right? Yeah, and, and, and it's happening. The littlest thing. Humans seem to have this innate feature about themselves that causes us to judge and causes us to look at another individual differently because it doesn't seem... And we share a whole set of cultural norms and cultural rules that we all understand, but each one of us as an individual is looking at somebody else as an individual and saying, well, that doesn't really meet with my standards for what I consider a human. That's on, my, on par with me. And I can't tell you how many times, I've, I've even stood in classrooms, you know, first day of class, right? People don't necessarily know me yet or haven't had my class, and they come in, People talk to me like I'm a little kid or they think I'm a student in the class. I've had people not take me seriously. You know, I go to stores and I purchase things and, you know, I go about my everyday. Yes, I'm very small, thank you. And, and you know, I, does that mean my brain doesn't function well? I mean, I, you know, I've got degrees. Are they special degrees for little people? I mean, and I have plenty, of, I even have people that look at me all the time. Oh, do you get disability because you're short? Are you a midget? Are you a dwarf? I mean, I might have students that will ask these questions. Or even better yet, I was teaching an environmental science class one time in Illinois. When I was in grad school out there, I taught at the community college. And this woman that, you know, was obviously an older woman, she had to be in her 60s or 70s. She would always just sit there and glare at me, glare at me, glare at me. Never spoke. One night I was talking about the environmental revolution during the 1960s and Rachel Carson. And after I finished, she was still looking at me. I just turned to her and I looked at her and I said, well, did I get it right? <laughs> and she just lost it. She laughed. And, I mean, I obviously didn't live through the time, and, and she had. But she was just looking at me like, oh, I guess you can teach this class. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much. It was very, it's very interesting to notice how people respond to me from time to time because of how short I am. So I, I find it interesting. But I mean, something as simple as that, I mean, we can talk about the bigger things that I've mentioned, but something as simple as age or weight or height, you know, 
like somebody in a wheelchair. This, there's, there's things that come into play. You know, you want to tell Stephen Hawking he's not capable of doing something? Good luck to you. You know, just because someone has something different about them or uses equipment doesn't mean that they can't do what everybody else is doing or that they're any less human than anybody else. So I think it's very important to look at things like X-Men and other comics and science fiction because we still need to hear these messages that we need to start pushing forward and make these changes to break these cycles and reach these other levels to maintain our species and continue to further us over time to make sure that we survive. Um, you know, anything mental illness, unborn people with disabilities. Do you know that you can terminate a pregnancy now if you don't want a special needs or disabled child? You can make, the parents are making that choice now. You can, t you can have an abortion if you know that child's going to be defective in some way or won't have a normal life. It's going to be difficult. And people have that option. And they ha we have the, the ability to make that possible if somebody says, well, I don't want this child. And all kinds of ethics come into play. Cultural ethics, individual ethics medical ethics, should we be offering people this option? It's available. It's just as available as if you told your doctor, hey, you know what, you know that baby? You know, let's, let, uh, this is what I want for my baby, and you're picking out features. And they do it. You know, designer babies, we've all heard about this. It's been talked about forever. ESPN a few years back, from 2012, came out with an article whether or not to allow athletes to be considered professional and play professional sports or compete at a professional level if they had artificial limbs. Were these artificial limbs or eyes or ears, hearing, things like that, were these enhancements in some way that gave them an edge? And this, this, these are valid articles that are coming out and valid questions that are popping up in our society. Are these people any different than the rest of society? So all these things come to light when we talk about things like X-Men, and X-Men represents the full conglomeration of, of everything that we deal with every day as humans. You know, of course we have experimentation. Oh yeah, let's experiment on the mutants. When haven't we done that with the African Americans, the mentally ill, the Jews, the, Jews, the mutants? We put genes in food, and we say, oh, that's good. We can deliver vaccines to people, and, and so on and so forth, and manipulate food, and enhance it, and this, that, and the other. Who knows what they're really putting in the food? Or what the real purpose is? And that came through when we saw Logan, you know, what they were putting in food to genetically alter things and control mutants. Anyhow, we also have the issue of the cure and all the protests that break out over that. Well, people don't want the LGBT population to be accepted. We want to cure you. How many sectors have popped up to do that over time? Right? Abortion rights. Uh, that's been wrestled with. So, you know, all these things that we've talked about, genocide, registration. They're going to put that chip in you. Now we have real ID driver's licenses. You can't get into a federal building unless you have this, this thing on your license. You know, lack of power in people that are oppressed. You know, the ethics of our technology. We've talked about this. Creating soldiers genetically, also raised in Logan, which was the whole thing behind the children. Have you all seen Logan? Have you seen Logan? Oh, you must see Logan. You must see Logan. Um, I mean, that blew me away. They programmed these kids, and then they started euthanizing. I can't tell them. I can't tell everybody in the room. Now they know what I'm going to say. They started euthanizing them because they weren't effective, and then they started creating the other. Oh, I know I won't, I, I can't spoil too much for you guys. I, all I can say is you must see this film. It's fantastic in the X-Men series. But yeah, registration. We need to register all the mutants. Why? So we can keep tabs on them. Well, here's our human history right in front of us. Slavery, you had to be registered to show that, you know, proof of being free. You had to be registered in Nazi Germany, you know, you've all seen the tattoos people have that were in concentration. Eric and X-Men has that. 
Um, gun registration, you know, mention of dangerous weapons, mutants of dangerous weapons in our schools and overall society. They consider the, the mutants to be weapons. We see that play out many times in the X-Men series. And, you know, we wrestle with gun registration, we wrestle with gun laws, and you know that people are still going to have these things, whether you like it or not. And the X-Men, the X-Gene isn't being kicked out of your population anytime soon. You're still going to have it produce mutations because it's part of your gene pool. So what are we going to do? You know, the real ID card now. Um, Texas and California, you know, are talking about RFID chips to track students and even, you know, implants at birth to track people. Well, they say, oh, it's good. We can put your health information. And you say, oh, I have it with me. Oh, yeah, I bet I have it with me all the time, too. What else I got with me all the time? So, I mean, these are real things that are happening, being debated. And I think X-Men is, is a real pause to say, hey, let me investigate this in my society. I've heard about this stuff happening. Let me go look up if this is really happening, what articles I can find. You know, and then you know what's going on. You can contact politicians. You can talk to other people. You can help influence policies and, and political decisions. So I think this, that X-Men is a very powerful tool and giving people hope, but also inspiring people to think and ask questions about their own society and help drive change in that society and influence political decisions. We all have that power to do that, even though it seems very discouraging on an individual level, it's there. The Detroit riots, Ferguson, Missouri, and you look at X-Men Last Stand down here. I mean, you've got massive social upheavals and rioting that's taking... This Detroit riots, Ferguson, Missouri, X-Men Last Stand. You're talking about the Civil Rights Movement. You're talking about something that just recently happened in our time and is still happening. And you're talking about race riots being portrayed in X-Men. I think that they're trying to put out there these messages that this stuff is really happening. It still happens. Be aware of it and think about what's happening to your world and, and how you maybe can bring about change in that world. Okay. Let's see, how many more of these do I do I have? We still got plenty of time. Oh, we're almost, goodness, we got plenty of time. All right. I just wanted to see where I was because I get carried away. I love talking X-Men. I could do this all day with it. I mean, there's so much. An hour does not do justice to the themes we can draw out of X-Men. It really doesn't, and so I always feel like I'm shortchanging. It's like, how much can I cram in here? But cultural, you know, you have a cultural mirror, race and ethnicity, again, I will raise that. Race is a very ethnocentric type of term. Um, as I said earlier, there is no such thing as race. There is no such thing as racially classifying humans based on skin color and physical features. Anthropology, the American Anthropological Association, was very forward about that in 1998 when they published their newsletter, they published their, their data, and they published their official statement. We can't biologically classify different groups of humans based on physical features. I am waiting for the day when the rest of the world catches up with their little forms because they think they're cute. You know, you used to always just say race. Now you know it says race, and then there's one for ethnicity, too. It's like, oh my goodness, this is just getting worse by the hour. You know, I don't think they caught that. Well, they're trying. They haven't quite connected the dots yet. Okay. So, I, you know, I think it's interesting. And then, by the way, the other box that's interesting to me is that you're either Hispanic or you're not Hispanic. Says, well, and what are you doing with all the non-Hispanics? How do you figure that mess up? Oh, that's because we look back at your race and then your ethnicity boxes. So, oh, my gosh, this just gets worse by the hour. The term race is a culturally constructed term. It doesn't actually exist. Okay? I mean, it's, it's used to establish institutions and social order. That's all it really is. It's used as a political tool to make others feel like they're inferior, to instill fear in your general population, to legitimize your power, and to hold on to that power. You know, people in power are terrified of losing their power. And like we were saying earlier before you even came in, how much, how much Obama was still being hammered.
hammered even after he was in office for eight years. You know, oh, you're not really a citizen. Oh, you know, and he took a lot of flack for being African American over eight years. It's like, what is going on? The, yeah, the whole, the, yeah, the birth certificate thing, everything. It's like, oh my goodness, you know, the country elected a person they thought would do the right job. I mean, we've got to start looking at it that way. The other thing that bothered me was how the media went wild with the first African American, you know, the first black. <laughs> to me, yes, that's exciting. It'll be just ex as exciting when we finally elect a female president. But on the, you know, on the other side of it, to me, it's like, my gosh, we still think like this. Why can't we just focus on electing a person for what they can do, for the for the qualifications they have, for the for what we think they can do for us? I'm voting for who I think is the best candidate. I'm not, you know, but our our whole society is geared around. You know, and this is another side to X-Men that I do want to talk about. But think about it. Oh my gosh, it's the first for the African Americans. It's the first for the women. It's the first for this disabled person. It's a, you know, every little group is getting their little victory in all this. So there's another side to X-Men that I haven't talked about yet. Um, another issue I do want to mention, there's another slide coming on it. There's something I want you to keep in mind from it, which is also the identity politics and the idea that the X-Men are called gifted and have gifts. And there's a new TV show coming out this fall on Fox on Monday night. It's called The Gifted. And so is this just another way, and another way of looking at X-Men is, is this just a way to encourage each group to talk about what they think is special about them for political gain? You know, the whole idea that, well, my group has these needs, and this is who we are, we're special, and so we should have this kind of thing. And we know all the groups do it. So that's another thing we could be looking at at the in terms of the use of the term gift and gifted and isolating, well, what does that mean about the rest of the other humans then, if you're so special? Well, well we, we want to get a political foothold too, so we have these gifts. So, oh my goodness, is this a case of identity politics being played out as well through X-Men? Is this this other side to the coin? I still like I still like and am very much drawn to this idea of hope, humanistic approaches, equality, just based on the fact that you're human and we just treat you like anybody else. You know, it doesn't, none of these other things matter. And I'm waiting for the day we finally get to that level in our own world where people are just, you know, in positions they're in, not because of who they are, not because of what group they fought for rights with, not because they're a token for this, oh, we have to meet a quota for that kind of thing, or just because of this is what you can bring to the job, these are your qualifications, you're the best person. What you look like, what your physical abilities are, none of that stuff matters. So I'm waiting for that. But I, so I think there's still a lot of messages of hope here, more so than the issue of identity politics, but that got raised to me one day, and I had never thought about it before. And I'm like, gee. And it really bothered me, so I had to give it some thought. And I guess you could read that into this, with the way they present the X-Men, and use the word gift or gifted. So I can see where that might, might come into play here as well. Um, of course, we're talking about ethnicity, you know, um, which is really biologically or even culturally based. What cultural groups do you identify with? To you, that's your ethnicity. And there's a lot of people of mixed heritage now in the world because we can interbreed with one another because we're all humans. The same humans. So there's a lot of mixed populations these days. So, you know, someone who might be, you know, part African American, part European, some way, or even part Asian, what part of their heritage have they decided to embrace and express? So that's a culturally based type of ethnic identity. A lot of gray areas, and then we have a lot of people with these misfit identities, they just wrestle with who they are and where they fit in, um, and try to figure that out as they go, and eventually they, I hope everybody figures that out and finds a, a group they identify with. 
Uh, but you can, you can exist in many different groups and overlap groups. Now, the apocalyptic theme in X-Men is very clear. Human extinction at the hands of the human over ethnic conflict and fear of differences. Is this a real possibility for the human species? Can we annihilate ourselves over our differences? And that's a real theme in X-Men. And you hear it in some of the monologues that Charles gives at the beginning of Days of Future Past. And we, you know, we've got to listen to something that powerful because if we keep continuing in these cycles that we repeat, what's going to happen to the human species? Is, is all this petty stuff that doesn't really matter in the world going to really cause us to annihilate us? So I think that's a valid concern that X-Men also brings to light with the apocalyptic theme. And of course, we have the LGBT community, gender-constructed roles. Um, you know, even women still fight for equal pay and equal rights today in the 21st century. <laughs> this is going on. You know, and then you, you take a look around, you wake up, and you say, what century am I living? You know, am I in a crazy Twilight Zone episode or something? You turn on the TV or you read something and, and it makes your eyes roll and you become very concerned about your world. Now, um, gender is not impacted at all by biological sex. And the idea of, of gender roles or gender status or gender identity can differ very much from society to society. Um, so across cultural boundaries, there's different ways of looking at this. Um, Sex is biological. You were born male, you were born female. Gender identity, gender is a very fluid spectrum. And people fall at different points along that spectrum. It's like autism. There are people that are autistic, but where do you fall on that spectrum? And how do you decide what your gender identity is? You know, gender is, is culturally constructed. We, get, we have our children and we teach them what we think is gender. And that's the other thing about those little boxes on those forms. You got sex and you got uh, uh, gender, but they use gender and sex interchangeably. And they're not interchangeable. We've created these notions about what gender is culturally, but it's not the same as biologically. Sex and gender identity are two different things. Um, you know, so sexual preference, all this comes into play, I think, and what's normal comes into play certainly in X-Men and played out very well, I think, in terms of looking at what they did to, to look what they did to well, the Angel. And he was so distraught, mm -hmm. right, that he was, his father encouraged him to go and get the cure. They had this cure available. Rogue lined up for it because she was so distraught over who she was and how unacceptable she was and how much pain she caused people when she just touched them. And so she signs up to go and, and take the cure, you know. Um, Bobby, remember the kid Bobby that was the, the, the fire kid? The scene from one of the films when he's at the house with the parents and they finally call the police and his other sibling calls the police, of course. Um, and he should, that, you know, Logan's there, oh, I'm his teacher from the school. You know, they're not really telling him what's going on, but it's like, and Bobby's showing his parents and his, his siblings what he can do. It's like, and then it, it's, I think it was his mother, and he just looks at him and says, well, have you tried not being a mutant? It's like, well, how do you try not being who you are to please the rest of the world? This is who I am. Why can't you accept me for what I am? I, you know, I want to be happy with who I am. But I, I just love the question. It's like, well, have you tried not being a mutant? It's like, how do you, how do you not do something you're genetically programmed to do? You know, and that was another big thing with the LGBT issue, especially the, well, a lot of studies have shown that the brain chemistry of a gay man is similar to a heterosexual woman. Well, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I have a lot of friends who are gay. I, when I read that stuff years ago, when the study started coming up, it makes a lot of sense. No wonder they can match my socks for me. You know, and they have these, it's like, well, yeah, this is, makes a lot of sense. You know, and uh, when it comes to being trans, they, 
found that that's also genetically linked. If you're a transgender person, there's a genetic link to that. You know, and the body, when you know, when you're starting to grow and develop before birth, and the hormones start to kick in at about 10 weeks in utero, they can all those things are programmed genetically. One little mutation, you produce too much of this, not enough of that, or vice versa, and you grow up feeling like you're in the wrong body. And it's all controlled biochemically. And it was all programmed genetically. But people in these communities were put through hell. And we see that played out also very well in, uh, in X-Men. There's so many things we could pull from X-Men. Uh, because there's my issue of identity politics. Is this really all about somebody trying to showcase how these gifted or special interest groups, minor, you know, marginalized minority type groups, are just trying to focus on their needs and what they deserve because of what's happened to them, why do 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 Oh, we're Native Americans, so we need all this stuff. Is that what x is trying to showcase? My veterinarian would tell you yes. We were on a walk one day, and we got talking about X-Men, because he likes sci-fi and comics and stuff. We were on a walk with his dogs one day, because he lives near me. And he stopped, and he says, you know, I, I don't really care for X-Men. I said, what are you talking about? How do you not care for X-Men? This is the greatest franchise ever created. It's all about acceptance and diversity and fighting. Know, for equality in the world and this humanism type approach to the world. We want to break free of all these cycles. It's like, I don't like that people think they're special and, and deserve things because they're special and they, they have gifts. And it's like, oh, yeah. and I tried arguing with him. And then it really ate at my brain when I went home. I'm like, oh my gosh. I had to actually wrestle with this and think about it. But I sat down and I certainly could understand where someone could take that impression away from X-Men. My overall personal feeling, though, is that yes, you could get that impression from X-Men. However, I don't think that's the actual message of X-Men. I don't think that's the, the, the thing that gives it power, the thing that people are attracted to in it. I think it's still that message of hope and fighting for equal footing for everybody to be mainstream and just be treated as human. That's my personal gut feeling because there's too much social power in the X-Men franchise with the comics and movies and, and so forth. I do think that, you know, it may be incorrect for them to be referring to these as gifts, you know, the, mut the mutation, and maybe going a little far with the name the gifted for the TV show, maybe? I don't know. It's, it's a skeleton and Yeah. So, I, so I don't know if that's going to be an issue or not. I mean, I'd be, I'll be curious to see if I ever hear anything or read anything along the way about that. My veterinarian's got his mind made up, but that doesn't mean I listen to him. In that respect, I listened to him enough where I gave it some real thought and I'm still stewing about it. Um, finishing up here real quick, you know, the moral, the moral and ethics of gene manipulation. Designer babies, GMOs, artificial limbs giving you an advantage, gene therapy. We've got the bubble baby, you know, um, UCLA is using gene therapy on stem cells, you know, on stem cells to repair your immune system, to repair hemophilia. We're manipulating our embryos to create babies that we want, changing their sexes and everything. Yeah, I mean, if you've got a bad immune system, you know, you have the bubble boy and things like they have, they have to live in a very sterile, highly sterile environment because they could die if they contracted something because the immune system's like, we've got great technologies. How do we want to use them? And what's the right way to use them? And who's the person to decide what right way to use? So just some last minute tidbit food for thought on some ethical issues that are being raised on, on the technological side of X-Men, right? And just kind of finishing this up,
because I know our time's up. Um, we do know that diversity is very necessary in order for cultures to evolve. And I talk about this in just about every talk that I ever do. Just as much as we need biological diversity in our gene pool to continue the species successfully, we need individual behavioral differences as well. Those are just as important in order to bring about the social changes we eventually want to see happen. We need people who think differently and put those thoughts out there and put them into action to make those types of changes happen. And so I think having an individual sense, yes, you grow up in a particular culture, you're enculturated by it, you have a certain sense of morality and a certain sense of ethics that's instilled in you, but you also develop your own, which is individual moral compasses and ethical um, ideologies. And that's where we wrestle with these bigger issues in X-Men and the technology. And again, the contrast between civil rights leaders and working within the society to make change versus giving everybody a bad name and being that extremist group and making it harder for those who are really working for change within to make that change possible and helping fuel the fire of perpetuating fear in other people about your group. So I think we've covered this to a great deal of extent. Um, we've talked about some of these issues already in X-Men. And I just want to quickly mention the power of comics and comics being used as myth. Logan did a fantastic job with this. In the film, they're using the X-Men comic. He's helping the little girl, and she wants to go to Eden. It's in the comic. He, wait a minute. This is, the X-Men haven't been around for This is like somebody taking the Bible, who wrote the Bible, and said, this isn't how it happened at all. What are you talking But it's here. This is, no, that's not what happened at all. That little girl and those children were given hope of a narrative in the comic, and that comic and the narrative are used in the film to promote that hope and get those kids to safety. I think it was very beautifully done. I know we're, we're kind of over time, so I'm going to leave that there and get to my next talk downstairs, which is um, social significance of Hulk and the biology of the Hulk in about, ooh, 10 minutes. But thank you guys for being here and being part of the uh, the.